chapter 12, When in Rome, do as the Romans do. The boys were having a much harder time of it than Maley. The soldiers kept a firm grip on their shoulders, pushing them roughly and cursing if they tripped on the uneven stone-paved road. Later, the boys were to read that the stone used for building much of Pompeii was igneous rock, formed by erupting volcanoes millions of years before the Romans came. Sam considered trying to use the magic stone to wish them all home, but thought the better of it. He couldn't risk their captors laying their hands on it. Plus, they'd lost Jane and Maley. He didn't know if it would work when they were so scattered. Their two captors took them down a maze of streets, giving the boys glimpses into shops, houses, sheds and gardens. They headed always in the same direction and eventually came out at what was clearly the harbour. Beyond the grey stone harbour wall, a rocky littered yellow beach stretched along the coast as far as they could see, and in front of them were a number of boats, big and small, tied up on several long wooden jetties. The air rang with shouts and clangs as the two boys were marched along a jetty past fishing boats and fishermen packing the day's catch, to the end, where a number of rowing boats were tied. The two men gestured at the boys to get into one, and when Sam and Peter tried to protest, to explain that they had done nothing wrong, the soldiers picked them up and dropped them into a rowing boat. Bruised and intimidated, the boys sat quietly on a wooden seat in the front as the two men climbed in and tied the rope tethering them to the jetty and started to row out. They rode expertly and fast, and very soon they found themselves approaching the mouth of the harbour. The boys could see ahead of them, just beyond it, several large wooden ships. They flew red, white and yellow flags printed with a menacing black eagle-like bird. All along the sides were square openings. Four oars, Peter whispered as they passed close by one, and they forgot their bad situation for a few seconds as they stared in wonder. The front and back of the warships ended in huge curved bows, and on one were large, brightly painted figureheads. The boat they were approaching had a massive curved swan neck and head, but the others were headed by strange figures, half man, half beast. See, see those long metal things sticking out on the other end of the boat, just above the waterline? Peter pointed. Those are metal battering rams to drive into enemy boats. Sam looked at the closest ram which ended in three ominous-looking curved metal claws and gave a small shudder, imagining being inside one of the ships when the ram came shooting through the side, splintering the wood, letting the lethal salt water pour in. When the rowing boat reached the warship's side, the two soldiers shouted and the head of a bored man with a massive black beard popped over the side. He had a loud conversation with the sailors and then tossed down a rope ladder. One of the soldiers gestured for Sam to climb it, and reluctantly he went up, knocking his knees and scraping his knuckles painfully. It seemed like there was a technique to doing it. As he reached the top of the ladder, the bearded man grabbed him roughly by the back of the neck and hauled him onto the deck. He threw him to the ground and there was a loud thunk. Turning his head, Sam saw, to his horror, the stone rolling across the deck. His zip had come undone during all the harsh handling he'd experienced over the last hour. The stone bounced twice and came to rest on the poop deck. He lunged towards it, but the bearded man grabbed his sheet, roughly yanking him away, and went and picked it up. He examined it closely with a puzzle day and then put it in a leather pouch which was attached to a belt slung low on his hips. As Sam watched, horrified from his sitting position, he saw Peter's head appearing above the ship's side. Peter was likewise hauled up and thrown unceremoniously onto the deck. He's got the stone, he's got the stone. Sam hissed desperately to Peter, indicating the bearded man. Their captors did not embark but started to row away and the bearded man said something to the boys, beckoning them to come with him. He took them to a dark opening in the deck and pushed them roughly down another dead ladder into the depths of the warship. It was dimly lit by light filtering in from the oarlock openings and it smelt horrible of sweat and other unclean, unidentifiable things. It was empty apart for rows of rowing benches. The bearded man pointed to several buckets, next to which lay two objects, identifiable as scrubbing brushes, although the bristles stuck out the top and the brush had to be held carefully so that the bristles did not hurt their hands. 
The bearded man handed them a bottle of something which smelt strong and strange and gestured to show that they should pour a bit on the floor and then scrub. They dropped to their knees and started to work diligently, scared of their overseer who radiated bad temper and strength. They exchanged a desperate look as they worked. They needed to talk, but it was not possible while the bearded sailor stood over them, glowering, his arms folded. Once he gave Sam a hard kick and motioned for him to scrub harder. But, after a time, to the boy's huge relief, he seemed satisfied they were working properly and left them, shouting something to someone on deck as he climbed up the ladder, making the boys jump. He's got the stone. What are we going to do? Sam whispered to Peter. We'll all be stuck here forever. How about we try asking him for it? Peter said without much conviction. If he thinks it's just a stone, he might give it back. But the problem is, it might look like a stone, but it kind of gives the impression it isn't, if you know what I mean, Sam said glumly. You can sort of feel it's something special when you hold it. We just have to seal it back then, Peter said, trying to sound confident. He put it in his belt pouch. Maybe we can hold hands and then I'll grab onto his pouch and wish ourselves back and the girls, Sam said. Well, we don't even know if it works if we're far apart. When it took Mary and Phoebe to the Jurassic, they were pretty close to us when I made the wish. Imagine if we left the girls here in Pompeii. I hope they've escaped. I hope they're safe. We could try that, but I think for now we should just keep our heads down and Blackbeard and the stone in our sights, Peter said prosaically. I really don't think it would just abandon us here. I really don't. Okay, well, good, Sam said, still feeling terribly anxious. I hope to goodness you're right. It's abandoned my great-grandfather. True, but he said he thought he was meant to be there, so... Well, let's just work hard so we don't get into any more trouble and try to work out what to do, Sam said. I think, maybe, we're, you're right about the stone. It did sort Sunny out, after all. It didn't just dump her back in the Jurassic. My hands are starting to crinkle and peel from this horrible cleaning stuff, Peter complained after a while. I don't think we want to know what it's made of, seeing I once read that the Romans used powdered mouse brains for toothpaste. Blackbeard came to check on them several times and to take them to refill their buckets with clean seawater. Each time this happened, the boys looked frantically around as they carried out his orders, trying to think of a way to get hold of the stone, but they didn't get close enough and couldn't find the nerve to jump on him and grab at his pouch. He was, anyway, preoccupied by a small group of men sitting on the deck in a rowdy circle, playing some game which involved a dice, and he stayed at a distance from the boys, keeping an eye on the game. No good, Sam hissed at Peter as they went down the ladder to the gloomy inside of the boat for the third time. I couldn't get close enough. The boys were at their back-breaking job for what seemed like hours and hours, but was probably only two. They got tossed some bread at lunchtime. It was a creamy brown colour and surprisingly delicious for a plain lump of bread, although they both found bits of stones in their pieces. Definitely stone ground, Peter said, and Sam gave him a weak smile, appreciating his attempts at humour when the situation was so dire. When they had scrubbed the entire floor twice, Blackbeard waved them back onto deck and sent them to sit in a cramped corner by a pile of smelly ropes. They sat, watching his every movement as he went back to the game being played on the other end of the ship. After what seemed like ages, they heard calling from the water on the other side of the boat. The sailors had come back for them. After a brief conversation between Blackbeard and the sailors, Blackbeard indicated that they must climb back down into the rowing boat. The boys exchanged horrified glances. They couldn't possibly leave without the stone. One of us must try to grab the stone and wish us all home. Peter whispered urgently. We must both go for him. You go for the pouch and the stone, and I'll try and stop him stopping you. Do it when we walk past him. I'll say now. But before the boys could try their desperate plan, there was a sudden loud rumbling noise, as if a million bricks had been tossed out of the sky onto the earth, and the boat gave a sudden heave. Within seconds, the sea was covered in strange, sideways-moving waves, which seemed to come from nowhere, and which got progressively bigger and bigger. As the boys glanced frantically around, they noticed that even the jetties in the harbour seemed to be moving, the wooden planking rippling, and to the west, above a dome-shaped mountain, a massive plume of smoke was rising up, growing like a black mushroom. What's happening? Peter cried out fearfully. I think it's an earthquake, 
Sam gasped, grabbing for support as the boat swung sideways, snapping its moorings. A huge wave broke over the side, flooding the deck with foam-laced water. All was confusion and shouting as the men on the deck ran to secure ropes and sails. The soap boys held on for dear life as the boat swung in a wide circle. Blackbeard rolled past him, thrown off his feet by the violent movement. Quick as thought, Peter and Sam leaped at him. Blackbeard's reactions were slow and confused, and as Peter threw himself onto Blackbeard's chest yelling, Go! Wish! Sam grabbed for his pouch. He managed to flit it, flip it open with one hand and frantically thrust his other hand in. With indescribable thankfulness, he felt his hand close around something smooth and round, and he shouted, I wish we were all four home on the hill. Through the darkness and the sickening whirling, falling, both boys tried to sense if the girls were there too, but it was impossible. They shut their eyes against the brightness and then felt a small jolt as they landed, for once quite gently. Perhaps the stone had decided they'd been through enough through for the day. They opened their eyes. The air was hot and still, and a lizard, a sunny survivor, lay on the rock by their heads, basking in the morning sun. The boys sat up, frantically searching, but there was no sign of the girls. They're not here, Peter cried out in distress. We have to go back now. They stood up, and as they did so, they heard a shout from somewhere to the side of the hill. Maylie, Maylie, Peter yelled, running wildly across the top, trying to see all sides at once. His relief when he saw her, standing on the slope on the other side, looking confused, was beyond description. Never in his life would he ever to be, be able to be really angry with her again, not after that awful moment when he thought she'd been left in Pompeii. He sprinted down to her and grabbed her into a hug as Sam came running up, beaming, but their relief was short-lived. They could not see Jane. They started to search, to call and shout, but the increasingly frantic efforts were met by silence. After five minutes of fruitless calling and searching, they stood on the top of the hill by the fossil and looked despairingly at each other. I'm going back for her, Sam said, his voice tense. For who? Jane's voice said behind them, and they swung around, relief flooding them as they saw her smiling face. Everyone began to talk at once, and it was a while before they were able to pay attention to each other's stories. You go first, Maley, Peter said eventually. Tell us what happened after the fat man fell. Maley told them that she'd been kindly treated by the fruit seller and his wife who had come to take over from him a bit later in the day. They'd let her remain under the wagon, and although she grew hot and uncomfortable with the passing time, the things she saw from her hidey hole were alarming, and she'd stayed put. She'd seen chained slaves wending their unhappy way through the marketplace, herded by an overseer cracking a whip. And she'd seen two soldiers having a fight, driven on by the cheers of the crowd. She'd seen a chanting procession, carrying burning torches and platters of flowers and fruit to the temple, and a man ringing a bell and reading some announcement from a piece of papyrus. She'd been watching a fisherman selling fish to a little girl who looked only a bit older than herself when the earthquake hit. As the tremor rolled through the earth's surface, the square had become a mass of shouting, screaming, running people. The vibrating earth had reminded Maylie of trying to run on a jumping castle. Some roof slates had fallen off the buildings close by and fruit had rayed down from the piled up heap of grapes, peaches and lemons above Maylie's head. And then Maylie had felt herself falling. The first thought was that the ground had cracked open under her feet, but in a second she recognised the sensation and realised she was being called back by the stone, back to the Karoo. Girls were horrified at the boy's tale especially when they heard how Blackbeard had taken the stone and how they had had to grab it back, taking advantage of the chaos caused by the quake. And what happened to you? Sam asked Jane once their tale was done. Well, I ran as fast as I could from the man at the temple and I got to the other side of the marketplace without being caught. I stopped running because I thought it would attract attention. I thought I should go and wait for you by the gate we came in by, if I could find them. I'd gone about five steps when I felt someone grab my shoulder. It was a man and a huge woman. He wasn't so scary, but she was. She had big moles all over her face and long grey hair. She looked like a witch. The man held my arms behind my back and she tied my wrists and then they dragged me down an alley. I shouted and screamed and she hit me. Jane indicated her face and they could see that the area around her eye was turning a slight purplish colour. I was scared after that, so I just kept quiet and followed them. She kept pulling my rope so hard, almost fell over. 
we walked and walked and eventually came to the city gates, not the ones we came in by, others. We went through them and I saw this huge round building. I couldn't think what it was. And then I realized it was a circus, you know, where the Romans held shows, where they made gladiators fight each other and wild animals. Well, they took me into it, into this dark, long passage with all these huge closed doors. It smelled yuck, all moldy. Then we went into another stone tunnel and there were a whole lot of wild animals in these tiny pens built into the wall. Big pigs with tusks and then another two lions and then another a bear. It couldn't even sit up properly in its tiny prison. Also some leopards. It was horrible. They tried to hide against the back walls of their pens, but there was no place to hide, of course. I noticed that their doors were only closed by huge metal pins which fitted into a socket. I noticed that particularly because I thought how easy it would be for anyone passing to open it, and that obviously they weren't worried about that or they would have proper locks. Anyway, the scary lady took me up some steps to a room filled with cushions and things. She showed me to take armfuls of cushions and to follow her. We went through lots of small stone corridors and then out, and I saw we were at the top of the circus room. There were rows and rows and rows of stone seats. She shouted something at me, and I guess I had to start putting the pillows out on the stones. I put them too far apart, and she tried to hit me again, but I ducked away. She was so big and heavy, she couldn't be bothered to chase me. We went back again, then she left me. I went up and down, up and down a million times, laying out the cushions on the seats. Some men had come into the arena and were practicing. They would shout something, then clash their swords and stand back. I kept thinking I was dreaming. Everything was just so crazy. I was down in the cushion room, collecting another load, when there was a funny rumbling noise and the ground shook. I heard shouting and lots of people started running through the passage, to the entrance, I guess. I ran out to the top, to where the cushions were, and I saw everyone shouting and running away, back to the town. I ran back in, past the cushion room, to the tunnels. The animals were going mad, they were so scared. I ran and I opened all their doors. I thought they'd run out immediately, but they cowered back and I had to shoo them out. It was quite scary. I wanted to get us all out in case the ground shook again and the building started to collapse. Jane stopped for a minute and drew a breath as she remembered how scared she'd been. Scared, but determined. The three children who had been listening in straw looked at her with great respect. That was so, so brave, Jane, Sam said. Yes, Peter agreed. You did so well to free those poor animals. Jane flushed with pleasure and continued her story. Thanks. Well, anyway, luckily the animals seemed to know where the exit was. Maybe they could smell the fresh air. And once I'd collected them all in the passage, they started to run. All together, the wild pigs, the lions, the bear and the leopards. It looked so weird. I felt like Noah emptying the ark. I ran after them, and when I reached the exit, I saw they were already quite far away, spreading out into the fields, heading for the hills, I hope, and then I was spinning and falling and back on the hill, and then I saw the three of you up here. I was never so glad to be home. The children were on the lower slopes of the disappearing hill when they heard calling and saw Simon James's mother standing in the kitchen garden, waving to them to come. Seems like you want it, Peter said. We'd better hurry. Mrs. Noel came to meet them, saying that they had made scones for Jane's last day and that all the children should come in for tea. Were you paying you were Romans? she asked, looking at their costumes, and they nodded silently, although the older children cringed rather at the word playing. She frowned at the curtain tassels wrapped around their waist, but not wanting to spoil the tea, just told them to return them immediately. The two mothers were a bit puzzled by how quiet and subdued the children were. They ate their scones, drank their tea, and didn't say a thing. I wonder if they've had a disagreement, Mrs. Noel whispered to her sister when they went to the kitchen to refill the teapot. I don't think so. They all seem very polite and nice to each other. Given the strange silence, Jane's mother was only too pleased when Jane suddenly asked a question. Mum, remember when Auntie Lee went to that Roman town called Pompeii? Why did she go there? I think it's because the town was beautifully preserved by being covered in volcanic ash and lava when a volcano called Mount Vesuvius blew up. The whole village of Pompeii and other towns like Herculaneum were buried and forgotten for hundreds and hundreds of years after the eruption. I seem to remember they were rediscovered by someone digging a river channel. Auntie Lee said it was amazing, like stepping back in time. Why do you ask, we sweetie? she added, wondering vaguely why the children looked so shocked. Um, um, well, we were dressing up like the Romans. Were there earthquakes too? 
Yes, yes, I think the area had quite a few over the years. No one realised that the mountain was building up a huge chamber of magma under it and that it was going to become a volcano. Sam gave Peter a nudge, and as soon as the mothers had left the room, he turned to Jane and said furiously in a mocking, squeaky voice, Let's go to Pompeii, such a lovely Roman town. Let's go and enjoy a nice earthquake or two. And please, oh please, let's not miss the fun eruption of Vesuvius. Well, Jane said very indignantly, well, an expression turned slowly from one of angry defensiveness to one of amusement. Well, she repeated weakly, Auntie Lee said it was so, so interesting. And I think I must have stopped listening before she um, got to how it was preserved in volcanic ash and lava. She tailed off and looked apologetically at them. Sam stared back crossly for a few seconds, then the funny side of it hit him, and soon all four of them were rolling around, quite hysterical with laughter. After tea, they went and googled Pompeii. They discovered it had been a flourishing Roman village until the fatal day in AD 79, when the volcano Mount Vesuvius had erupted. They read that a few hours before the eruption, there had been several earthquakes, and a big mushroom-shaped plume of smoke had been seen rising above Mount Vesuvius. This huge cloud went some 33 kilometres up into the sky and then rained down pumice, volcanic rock, and ash and poisonous hot gases. Remember we saw that black cloud from the boat, Peter said excitedly. That must have been the first sign there was going to be a huge eruption, and we felt the first of the earthquakes. I wonder how many there were before it actually erupted. It says here that the sea floor was moved and the coast was pushed further away afterwards. Wow! Look at this picture of Mount Suvius today. It's just a massive empty crater inside. The entire top of the mountain and the rock inside was blown away. It says it was as strong as a massive nuclear explosion. Around 20,000 people lived in Herculaneum, which was a nearby town, as well as Pompeii, San Red, and they found about 1,200 bodies. So quite a few people must have left before it got too bad. I wonder how long after we were there that it happened, Jane said. From what I can see here, it must have happened that night, Peter said. A huge explosion happened around one o'clock at night and then the pyroclastic flow probably began early the next morning. Jane gave a shudder. Poor people. What is pyroclastic? Mary asked. It's a kind of mixture of rock and gas which flows along the ground like a current, Peter said. And there was also lava coming out of Vesuvius, so it was a terrible place to be. Still, it sounds like most people got away. Well, the wild beasts got a good start, at least, Jane said. Hopefully they got well away by the time all hell broke loose. I wonder if the horrible witch lady got out. I hope my kind fruit fellers got away, Mary chimed in. And I wonder what happened to Blackbeard, Peter said. And the two sailors who captured us. I guess getting away by boat would have been easy. Unless there was a big tsunami because of the earthquakes. I'm going to research all about Pompeii and see what historians and archaeologists have got right, Sam said. I also want to check out some garum recipes and see why it pongs so badly. Jane looked miserable. And I have to go home tomorrow. Will you go on another adventure soon without me, do you think? No, Sam said. I think after the last one we need a good break. We almost lost a stone. We could have been stuck in Pompeii and died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. I wonder if archaeologists would have noticed anything strange and modern about us if they excavated us, Jane said ghoulishly. Sam shuddered. Oh. It's a horrible thought. I'm going to put the stone back in the fish pond just now, right at the bottom where no one can see it. I think we've had enough adventures for these holidays. Just then, their fa his father came in and looked at their filthy, unravelling togas with approval. At last, the children looked like they'd been involved in some rough, dirty activities. Ha! Huh, I see I almost missed tea time. Well, when in Rome do as the Romans do, he said jovially, and took us gone poured himself a rather cold cup of tea and went out. The children were silent for a minute and then Maylie spoke determinedly. Next holiday, I want to go and see Thunny. Well, maybe, Sam said. Come, let's all go and put the stone in the pond so it's safe until next time. And that is exactly what they did. And that is the end of Time Travel Misadventures Book 1. Book 2, which is entitled Where'd You Get That Amulet, will continue the time travel adventures of Peter Maley, Sam and Jane and will be out in five to six weeks. 
please make sure to subscribe to this podcast or my Impact Stories YouTube channel if you're listening on YouTube so that you'll get a notification. See you then.